And it really does make me think about th this concept of, you know, the proximity principle. If you hang out with five guys that are on purpose, you'll become the sixth. If you hang out with five guys who have great relationships, you'll become the sixth. If you hang out with five guys that, that are good men, tr good, trustable men that are being courageously vulnerable in the world, you will become the sixth. And it's counter to, I, I think, the way that most men do it, do life, which is going it alone. Part of, I think, a, a modern day man's struggle is to figure out if they, if they have not found a group of trustable men to go live life with, trying to seek that out and find that, it's, it's in some ways very challenging. Welcome to Men This Way. Welcome to Men This Way, to our listeners. Uh, Tate, what's up, man? Welcome to your show. Hi, thank you. Good to I see you. I always do this. I always welcome you to what is now also your show. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an old, old habit, well, man. Die hard. Die, die hard. hard. We're very excited. Uh, Owen Marcus, welcome to Men This Way as well. Glad to have you, sir. My honor. So for our listeners, uh, Owen Mark is really excited about the conversation that we are going to dive into and have today. Uh, Owen, you've been working with men. I mean, you're a pioneer in this, I don't know, I would say maybe this, this movement of men's work that is, is that we're, that we've been in for a number of decades and men, you've been doing this work for about 40 years. You're the, uh, co-founder, founder slash co-founder. Uh, I know origin stories are always a little, can always be a little muddled, uh, but you, of the organization called Everyman, E-V-R-Y-M-A-N. Could you just tell us really, just briefly, what, what is Everyman? Well, I left Everyman, so I'm not longer with Everyman, uh, but I created it out of uh, all the work I'd done previously, uh, which was centered around working with men in their physiology or their somatic experience and using that as an avenue to get them more connected to their emotions and really to other people. And um, so I took everything that I had developed with every man and put it into this new company, which is Meld. Meld. Got it. Right. Well, the only reason I bring that up is because I think it's, it's, it points to, you know, in, in, in my uh, work doing men's work for the last decade or so. That's an organization that I think is has 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 done well to help other men start in their own men's group journeys. For sure, and that was always been my focus. Before we continue, would love to help our audience uh, get to know you a bit more. And one of the ways that we sometimes like to do this is is by asking you, and I'll ask you to t tell us a story, uh, something maybe an experience or a relationship that you had from your your early life that was pivotal in shaping you as a man? I didn't know this until graduate school, but I went through school with dyslexia and then later I realized I had Asperger's. So um, that was really pivotal. I mean, it was not like one particular incident, but I was just saying to someone, a client of mine earlier uh, today about how um, I realized early on that I could not succeed like most men. And I really, really tried, but the more I tried, the more I failed. Uh, I was terrible at everything from <laughs> pickup lines with women to, you know, math, reading, writing, you know, all the things you'd expect. And uh, at some point, my only choice was to give up, not give up trying, but really surrendering. And that really was the portal for me to getting into everything I'd gotten into. So uh, I never would have thought this. Uh, but, um, you know, dealing with what were my challenges allowed me to uh, find the passion that I have today. What what inspired you? Again, you know, one of the, the things that Tate and I, I mean, we started this podcast back in 2018. The very first episode was talking about how we men don't have wise elders in our lives, right? We are devoid of us, particularly male elders. They're not been non-existent for most men, and uh, I'm sh that's something that continues to predominate. What was it for you, Owen? What, what inspired you to really step into this work 
serving men, doing men's work, like what was the pivotal experience for you? What, you know, every one of us men, when we come into this work, there's something that brings us to it. Usually a, a dark night of the soul or, or a revelation, or maybe it's an ayahuasca trip. I don't know. These days it's ayahuasca, uh, or it's a, or it's a relationship, right? An intimate relationship that brings you to your knees. What, what was it for you? I think there was an undercurrent of what I was just speaking about, but the, the critical thing was I was um, living with a woman and a beautiful woman. She really loved me. And I'll never forget, we're sitting on my couch and she's saying, Owen, oh, I don't feel you. And Oof. I would tell her, I, we, I wasn't an argument, but I would sort of debate and give her the reasons, the reasons oh. why she should feel me. And then she'd say, I know that oh, debate. I know those reasons. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel you. Like, I want to feel you. I give her more reasons. And, you know, and I was a little dense, but finally, finally, I go, all right, I hear myself. I'm, you know, I'm giving her reasons she, she wants to feel me. Now, I was smart enough to figure that out after a few minutes, but I certainly didn't know how to do it. And then in the back of my head, uh, I remember I have this old friend in D.C. Uh, he'd done something with men's groups. So I talked to Jim and he got me into something. And then in 1995, I started my first men's group out of the integrated medical clinic I had in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was a mediocre group, but it was enough to, you know, put me on this 30 year journey of just continuing to, you know, dive into all this work. And I got what I wanted, you know, being with men taught me how to be by or be with myself and communicate and connect with other people where, you know, doing it with women just sort of happened naturally. I'm super curious because the, the gym in your life, there must have been something about him, you know, in his being or in the way that he was living his life or the way that he, he was able to connect with you or, you know, what was it about Jim? What, what did he model for you that, that I guess opened up the door for you to reach out to him and, and want to know more. Uh, we've been friends for a while. He was also a client of mine, but he was a, he's a good 10 years older than me and he was a successful businessman, but he, you know, he, he was a recovering addict. He'd been that at that years ago. It was several years into that. And, and so he really saw the value of getting it together and getting it together with other people. And, I respected Jim for that. I mean, he came from the other side of the track, was really successful, but brought on his addiction and, and he was will and he was able to turn that around and and he would talk about how not only his AA meetings, but his men's groups really were pivotal in doing that. And with that, teaching him how to start to have healthy relationships with women. Beautiful. One, one of the founda foundational stories we often tell men, it's one of my favorite stories. It's about uh, Tate. <clears throat> and it's so it's eerily similar to what your girlfriend told you. I don't feel you. What, what did what did your wife say to you, Tate? I, I don't love feel telling. connected. I, we, we had just spent 45 minutes having a very in-depth conversation about our relationship and what we could do and what was working and what wasn't working. And at the end of the 45 minute conversation, she said, I, I just don't feel connected to you. And I and I was exasperated and wondered, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I'm in a, a room alone with you sitting on a couch, having a conversation about our relationship. What? else is there to do to feel connected to me other than this and i you were a much quicker study than i was because i i left that conversation still exasperated calling brian and saying i just had this you know crazy conversation with my wife and so the fact that you got it in a few minutes clearly you're a better study than i well <laughs> i was probably worse <laughs> off than you number one and um you know I had the awareness, but it took a while for me to even start to develop those skills. I understand. Let's dive into that now, because there's there's two words that, as we were doing, you know, preparing for this conversation with you, there's two words that really stood out for me that I, I want to use as a as a as the beginning into uh, I think what is what boy is is such an essential conversation for men. Let me just put those words on the table. The first word is somatics. And the second word is co-regulation, right? These are two words. These are, 
dare I say, these are specialties of yours and the work that you've done for many, many years. So, so could you, let's just start here. Could you tell us, what are we talking about when we, when that word somatics, co-regulation, what are we talking about and why is it, why should men be aware of, of, if not the specific words, but what they're pointing at? Well, somatics is, I think we all know now, means the body. And um, I think we all know this, but now science really has proven it. When we have an experience, the first thing that happens is our body has the experience. And then our emotions and then our mind. But we've been trained that, you know, it starts and ends right here. Uh, and so the co-regulation is that um, when like the three of us, we're, you know, co-regulating because I look at either one of you, you look safe. And, and I know this intuitively or instinctually because we as mammals are hardwired to read other bodies, particularly face. So, so all these little muscles of our face express what we're feeling. And, and, and the, the first thing is, is this person safe or is he unsafe? And so if you feel safe, I'm going to feel safe. And then I'm going to distribute those signals through my face, my body, my voice. And we start to co-regulate. It's sort of the mirror neurons. We start to connect, not just emotionally, but physically. And often what happens at first is that physical connection. So it's really hard to have connection when you don't feel safe. And this is, and you probably do this with your guys. This is certainly one of the things that we do is we make sure the space is safe because otherwise you're working at it. And if you're working at it, you, you know, you're not going to be at your best. You're working upstream with all that effort. So we want to downregulate, feel safe, connect to our bodies, use that connection to help connect to someone else. I think it's interesting, this word safety, because it's not a word that men tend to want to talk about, acknowledge that they don't feel safe, right? I mean, it took me decades in intimate relationships with women to figure out, holy shit, wait a second. I also don't feel safe most of the time in the relationship. Oh, and it's not that you're denying it. You just don't know it. I'm not even aware of it. Exactly. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. aware of it too. Yeah. We're not aware of it. And, and we're not aware of it for two reasons. One, because of stress and trauma we've had and how that's created disassociation through the freeze response, which we can talk about. But the other reason is the culture we grew up in. We're trained not to be aware. And if we are aware, we're trained not to say anything about it. Totally. Right. Yeah. It's, sh it's shamed out of us. Right. It starts for a lot of us on the playing field, uh, just in our on the playground, even just in our in our interactions, showing vulnerability, feeling fear is not manly. It's not what men do. I'm curious, how do you. Tate and I, we are such stands for safety in our work because we're doing deep work and we can't you can't do deep work if you don't feel safe right? All the, all the guards and protections go up. What are some of the things that you do in your work, especially when men, again, they don't even know they don't feel, they don't feel safe. They don't even, they don't even know that they don't trust you as another man or other men in the room. What are some of the ways that you, that you help men feel safe in your work? I'll do this. First, we create a set of rules of engagement that stipulate that it's safe, confidentiality to start with. Uh, so guys like rules. I mean, we, you know, we can't play a game unless we all agree on the rules. So we get that. Um, and then it usually takes someone to model it. And, and if we have completely new guys, like we're doing a training, we will model it. We will say something that's sort of outside the norm in terms of a reveal. Or one of us will just to, to prove to them that it's safe and that it's okay to take risks and and like we'll do a training with 60 guys they'll be in a big circle and then i'll often say look we got new rules of engagement and one of the rules of engagement here is you get cool you get honored for taking risks being vulnerable speaking your truth and so guys do this sort of check-in and they might say a few things we you know we keep it moving fast and then if one guy will sort of sit up and go okay i'm gonna i'm gonna take a risk here. I'm going to say something that I normally wouldn't say. And he's shocked when he doesn't get shamed. He's actually honored. And I'm, so, I'm you know, I know you guys get that. Yeah, and once yeah. 
one guy does it and then the next guy can and the next guy can and then often guys get competitive and they go well i'm going to outdo my re your reveal i'm going to be, be more outrageous and reveal something that's even a deeper darker secret and by the end you know guys know it's safe they've connected because you know when we can reveal something that's vulnerable and not be rejected and actually be honored immediately there's there's a sense of connection because honor is huge for men we will die for honor but we rarely get it from other men. Yeah. How does, I'm curious, this word somatics, you say it very simply means the body and, you know, which you, you said earlier, you know, men, we mostly live head up, you know, it, it begins and ends in our heads. You know, something I often think about sort of this weird aside is you remember that sub that died, the, 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 that, that imploded when people were going to the Titanic, it happens so fast that their brains couldn't even, they, could, they didn't get to have a feeling about it, right? They died not having a feeling about it. They died, like to your point, the body experienced it and they were gone before any emotional or mental processing could happen about it. I kind of take some solace in that. Like maybe, you know, we're going to die and I won't even know it happened. But it speaks to though, in, in this very interesting example, how indeed the body experiences everything before the mind ever registers it. And yet most of us men overwhelmingly only ever live in our minds. I'm curious, like how, how does that show up for men? Let's say there's a guy listening. He's a professional. He's a, you know, we have, you know, we have all kinds of professionals listening to, to our, our show sometimes just trying to find their way they're succeeding. They're out in the world. Like how, how could a man begin to recognize that he's if he's not conscious of it already, how might he begin to just like sit in his office, go about his day and realize, oh my God, I really am not feeling anything or I'm not connected to my body. Like what are some of the signs or some of the ways that, that you can help a man start to figure that out, see that? A while ago, I created what I call the rock form, your ROC. So we slow down to relax, we open up to be vulnerable and we reach out to be connected. But the key part, is the relaxation and the key to that is the slowing down because everyone tells us at least they always told me because i was always a little add slow down you know no excuse me they told me relax but they never told me how to do that and we really do that by slowing down and now breath work's gotten popular and, and, and guys have gotten more aware of some of the body functions so one of the great ways to slow down is to become aware of our breath relax your stomach and slow down our, our breathing so as we slow down our system and sort of leave that sympathetic or stress state, uh, we become more aware. So the beauty of body awareness is when you can be aware, when I can be aware of my body, I'm innately telling myself I'm safer, or safer than I maybe was 30 seconds ago. Because when we're not feeling safe, we're in a threat response, which is a survival response. As need be, our orientation is to the outside world because that's how we're hardwired. We, you know, we want to make sure there's no predators. Uh, and so when we are feeling our bodies, we're intrinsically telling ourselves that we're safe. We're not completely focused on this out here. And then we get this positive spiraling of, all right, I'm feeling my body. I'm feeling tight shoulders. Oh, I can relax my shoulders. Oh, oh, I feel a little fear. Oh, I can accept the fear. Oh, okay, I'm relaxing a little more. And so we train men to do that. And there's a lot of ways to do it. Breath works one, somatic mindfulness is another. And so there can be a bit of a formal practice. The, for, the power of the formal practice is you're literally creating or recreating or reinforcing neural networks. Because we have these networks, they do atrophy, they can almost dissolve away if we don't use them. And it's just like being very right arm, arm dominant and never using a left arm. So we're getting you to use your left arm. So you're starting to use these networks that are there so that when you are in a stressful situation, you're more apt to be one resilient, two stress hardy, which is to say that stress doesn't impact you like it would have. And three, just more aware where in their awareness, you have some choice. And so often in a stressful situation, as you said, we're in our head and we're in reaction. And then we're having this threat response. But as we can feel our body, we start to leave the reactionary state for a more responsive state. We got choice. 
So it's not that you're shutting down your head. It's like you're, you know, you're still thinking, but you got this dual attention. You know, what am I feeling in my body? What am I feeling emotionally? What am I reading here? So you start tracking all these other variables and you can do that simultaneously if you're trained. And then you, you can eventually get into that flow state where suddenly it's completely easy and you're just there and there's no effort. You know, Owen, one of the things I'm, I'm always just so fascinated about, about conversations like this is a, wor a brand new world can open up for a man when they tap into, become aware of the impact of, of various experiences in their life, happening to them experientially, living inside their body. And when they begin to understand the impact of that and then to be released from that, then again, a whole new world is open. But but for many men, they, they're they not really clued into what it is actually costing them to uh, stay inside of that state that they, you know, they were swimming in water and now they're there. So can you help us really get at what, what is it costing men to be living in this fight or flight mode where they're locked up in their body, they're disconnected from, from their feelings, their sense what is it costing men? What are, what are they missing out on? Well, I think, as you all know, and you're sort of saying, and we experience is often the first thing, the most common thing I see is their relationships, their intimate relationships with their partners, their family. It's costing them their health. Now, you know, I've been doing you know, the integrated health thing for decades, but now the science is really backing that up where we get allostatic load, which is a constant chronic stress state, which it literally wears out our body. I mean, guys would understand my metaphor. If you got an old rig, you stop at a stop sign, you push the clutch in, your engine's revving and it's always revving, you're going to burn out your engine. Well, that's what we're doing with, with our bodies when we're in a constant stress state. Our bodies aren't made to do that. And... <sighs> In its essence, when we're in a stress, which is a survival state, our orientation from the, the deepest somatic to our mind is in survival. And so we don't have resources to create, to connect, and to heal. And so when I had my clinic, you know, I had a lot of these docs who used to send me people that they couldn't help. And these were more the integrated docs. And inevitably what it was, was these people, men and women, were all jacked up. And so the, the procedures that were helping all these other patients of these docs weren't working for th these people because it was like trying to pour water into a stone. It just wouldn't go in. It, it wouldn't go down into the cellular level because they were so tense and so jacked up because they, they were in survival. Now, none of them thought they were in survival. They were all successful business people, but their nervous system was so jacked up in their endocrine system and their soft tissue system that they could not slow down enough to even have the proper supplements or meds or whatever to work. So we're paying a huge, huge price and we don't realize it because one, we're unaware. And again, the culture is unaware. So we're just a group of fish swimming together in the same stream and not knowing it. Yeah. And one of the things I'm, I'm really present to uh, around around what you're speaking into is that most men, unfortunately, they need a crisis to happen in order for them to really get clear that that something some new massive action has to be taken. But but I'm also always wondering, like, how what can a man do? How can you know, I guess the, the question is, how can men who are listening that aren't in a current crisis be jolted into action with before the crisis comes because it is coming? Uh, very good question. A question I've asked for close to 50 years. Uh, I think it's changing for a few different reasons. Men are more apt to be proactive than reactive. Um, I think doing what you're doing, getting the word out, all that helps. Being with other men that are into this helps. And they, they see the, the other possibilities. That's part of it. And one of the ways I've always worked, framed it, and this gets that or works for some of the men, is that when you get this down, you will perform better. You will perform better across the board. Your relationships will be better. You'll be better in bed. You'll be more successful at work. And and this is a key thing. You're going to end up 
in your success in a place that is satisfying because you can be very successful and work very hard and achieve what you want and be miserable because you're so disconnected. And you probably get guys like we do that that have been very successful, but at 50 or whatever, it's like, what happened? Yeah, when I when I I was 26 when I got out of the military and I was highly functioning, had a master's degree. I was a captain in the Air Force, uh, had money, savings, all that. And I was so dead in my body. I was so disconnected I was, to, from my body. I was so lacking aliveness or at least connection to my aliveness, but I was functioning, you know, outside looking in, I had everything most people wanted. And, um, uh, and unfortunately it were, it was multiple crises. You know, I, one crisis wasn't enough for me, Owen, as <laughs> I needed multiple, they weren't low enough. I needed to hit a real bottom, not a pretend bottom. Anyway, so, you know, you said something in your, your book about, um, so uh, a book, we haven't mentioned that yet, actually. Your book, uh, pull up the name, Grow Up, A Man's Guide to Masculine Emotional Intelligence. But you said something about something you've seen over and over. There's a pattern men go through. At first, they resist trying something new. Just resist it. Right. And then they do it and they actually get something more than they thought they would get from it. And then they become champions of it. Right. I see. Definitely. Your friend seen Jim. That. I mean, I was thinking about the story of your friend, Jim, right. Who probably resisted the recovery oh, yeah. and, and, and then probably in some ways became the biggest champion that became a light in the world for others to be able to find their way because he was so impacted by it. And then no one re was resisting more than I did in the beginning. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Well, well, we could debate that. We could we could arm wrestle over that, all of us. Yeah. Um. So so what, this brings me to back back to this word co-regulation, because I know one of the things, one of the real challenges in the work that we do is bringing men into group work with other men, and because of there's so much distrust between men. I, I again, I didn't wasn't even something that I was personally aware of that I didn't, I, you know, I could have told you I didn't like men. Yeah. We hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. Could have told you that, you know, going through the military, going through a fraternity, just seeing like, you know, developing that, you know, also having fathers that, that I, I you know, <laughs> didn't have the best relationships with, let's put it like that. And so I could tell you, I didn't like men, but I did, it didn't occur to me that I didn't trust men. Right. Until I really started to do men's work. And so, but this word co-regulation, what I've found, cause I've worked with individuals for many, many years and I, I love that and I still do it, but there's a magic that happens in the group experience when men come together in a group situation. And obviously, you know, men are co-regulating. You know, I was talking with Tate about this before we were recording, like in this co-regulation, like, like men get together all the time and they often are drinking. They're, you know, just, just, yeah, I don't want to be judgy about it. I'm not against alcohol and they get, but they're doing things that are kind of co-regulating in a, in a downward sense. The work we're talking about here, co men tend to co-regulate. Again, I'm using very broad terms here, bro. But, you know, and let's just say in an, in an elevating sense, like in terms of in the direction of the lives we want to live, what's going on there? What is this co-regulation that's happening when men get together in what I'll call trustable, safe, and still challenging spaces? What, what is that? What is that? Why should men care about that? Why do men need that? Versus why can't a guy just keep doing it on his own? You know, maybe hire one coach, maybe work just, why? Why? Well, I think all that works because, you know, I've been coaching guys for decades and I love doing it and it works. But me too. I'm a huge, huge fan of groups. I resisted them in the beginning. Um, I think it's several ways to answer that. I think one is instinctual. We're herd, tribe, pack, animals. You know, our ancestors grew up in a tribe. That's we wouldn't be here as a species if we didn't have a tribe that allowed us to survive and prosper. Uh, so that's in our genome to start with. Um, but we don't have it. We had it in school. We had, you know, had it in the military. But for most guys, after those experiences, it leaves. And I know when I talk to guys, they go, I got friends. I golf with this guy. And, you know, and I work with this guy. 
but they all will say privately, but I don't have deep conversations with these guys. And yes, because of the rules, because of the situations not appropriate. So yeah, we need this co-regulation. And then the science goes into the whole attachment theory. And attachment theory started with this guy named uh, Boyles, uh, and he learned how you know babies need to be connected or attached to their parents. And, and then Sue Johnson sort of expanded it into relationships. And essentially what they're saying is that we are hardwired not only to survive, but we're hardwired for connection. And there's different kinds of connections we need. We need the intimate connection of of our partners. Uh, Kids need that connection, and that's where we learn it. And and that's one reason we often fail at it, because we didn't have enough of healthy attachment, or what they call secure attachment. But we also need it from our peers. And when we don't have it, it's a stressful event. But again, as you're saying, because we're so used to not having it for so long, we don't know what we're missing. Yeah. Yeah. But... Not for every guy, but I think for most guys, once they get the essence of that, that that connection that just happens organically with a group of guys being themselves, that's all, just being themselves, and they feel safe to do that, uh, it's like, wow, I didn't know what I was missing. And sometimes it scares guys, but for most guys, it's like, I want more of this. And I want, you know, I want to enjoy it. I want to heal through it. And then what often happens, and I'm sure you see this too, is that guy gets in the other side of what brought him in. But he stays with it because, yeah, there's more to work on. And he gets that connection if it's like a weekly group. And he starts to realize maybe for the only place in his life where being himself, being authentic, being vulnerable, being funny, being just being himself is a contribution for another man or for the group. And he just shows up for a few hours every week, present, being himself, and he leaves the meeting like, well, I got something, I gave something, and then giving something that had an impact for this other man is a real gift for me. And it really does make me think about th- this concept of, you know, the proximity principle. If you if you hang out with five guys that are on purpose, you'll become the sixth. If you hang out with five guys who have great relationships, you'll become the sixth. If you hang out with five guys that 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 are good men, tr- good, trustable men that are being courageously vulnerable in the world, you will become the sixth. And it's counter to, I, I think, the way that most men do it, do life, which is going it alone, right? And so part of, I think, a, a modern day man's struggle is to figure out if they, if they have not found a group of trustable men to go live life with, trying to seek that out and find that it's, it's in some ways very challenging because you're, you're hanging out with guys who you haven't felt like you can have deep conversations with. So then now you're, you're trying to start up and, and now that disrupts a pattern inside of a a current relationship that they don't exactly know how to break down the walls that have now been established as a way of, Hey, this is the way we do business here. And talking vulnerably is that, that you may, that guy may not be up for that. So, how do men find their way if they know that there's something missing? They, they've been swimming in a certain water. They start hearing these kinds of conversations. How does a man find the group of five men or the group of 10 men? I don't know. You know, you, you work with groups of 60 men. How, how do they really find their way to get out of the lone wolfing that that is a death sentence? And at least affects the quality of their life. So... As we know, it, it means taking a risk. Now, there's a lot more available than it was five and certainly 10 years ago and online and, and live. So there's a lot of different men's organizations and trainings and groups. And you just do it. You just do it. You can start your own group. I certainly did. And you, I think you guys have. And But what I've found over the years is most guys believe they can't. So if they believe they can't, they won't. Uh, so what we've got around to doing is training guys. Well, backups. And then I used to, I, I still have a whole set of protocols I give to like you, if you wanted to start a group and it works and I've been using it for 20 years, my groups and other groups, but 
most guys need more than, than that. So if you want to start your own group, you need some training. And the training is, you know, a lot of it's experiential. And you in the experience with other guys. So it, it's hard for us to, to do something if we've never seen it or participated in it. I realize that. Uh, and it's hard to sell it on another guy unless you've had an experience. And what I what I've seen in this group, I started in Sandpoint 20 years ago, and it's now it's have over 500 guys in it, and it's still going strong. And I'm in a the Zoom group for the expats. Uh, is that like in this small town? You know, we have you know we have a great reputation, and guys are just lining up to get in. But you know, for years, you know, guys would sort of you know, resist, do it, get into it. Their lives would change. And then they became this evangelist. They were like grabbing guys in the street <laughs> and, and, you know, talking, mm-hmm. literally talking to strangers and giving them the whole rap. You got to join this group. I can see you're in pain. You're missing out. And the guys go, uh, but some of these guys would, would eventually join and, you know, they'd have this experience. So, I, you know, telling the guy to do it, that works. I think allowing these guys that, you know, sort of tip or stick their toes in in some way might be the way that a lot of guys come. And that's what we've seen over the years of doing, you know, live workshops or actually doing one tonight or, you know, meetups or, or, you know, virtual events there, there are a lower bar where, you know, they can like, they can get on a a zoom call with a group of guys and, you know, just be passive, which is fine. We can tell guys you can come to a group in the beginning and just observe. And they, you know, they observe and they see, well, this is safe. Hey, these guys are actually having fun. I want to be a part of this. I remember uh, years ago, we, a new guy came to one of our groups. He was his attorney. And so, you know, we all do a check-in. So we had him go last. And he says, you know, I'm just blown away. I, I, I can't believe guys are talking like this. I don't know what to say. Uh, and, so, and that was just at the check-in. That was just the beginning. That was beginning. just the check-in. And the guys were just yeah. being themselves. But yeah. we don't, yeah, until we have that experience, it's hard to believe that it's even possible. I I remember I have a golden retriever who is a total water dog, right? They're born, they're bred for water. Well, she would not go in the water for the first you know year of her life until one day we were at a river and there was another dog who was swimming in the river Talk about and our dog saw that. And she finally, for the first time, I think I, I had, I had, you know, very lovingly in a very fatherly way, thrown her into a pool, uh, maybe <laughs> in, yeah, <laughs> in the previous times, very respectfully, my wife might disagree, but no animal was harmed in the, in that experience. I promise our listeners, she, she loved it, but she would never take herself in the water until she saw another dog do it. And then she went in the water. And I think, you know, there's a very primal, primal response to modeling that, you know, I think of, I think of some of my early group experiences with men and they were all pretty unsafe. You know, I was a a fraternity in college. Uh, You know, fortunately, I mean, I was, I was, you know, men tended to give me some respect, at least after the pledging period, but as a member, right? I was one of the more respected men, but there were other men in the fraternity that were not respected. And the way they were treated was pretty awful. You know, it was pretty disrespectful. And it was, and I think, again, that just taught me as well that I I don't really get to be who I am. If I'm going to be a little nerdy or a little, a little odd, I'm going to be judged by these same dudes that say they're my brothers. Right. And then in the military, same thing. Like, I don't really get to say what's actually going on for me without consequences. I was working with, um, I did a, uh, I spoke at a surgeon's conference a few, like a month ago. And one of the things that I heard over and over is that surgeons, when it comes to mental health, surgeons, they're not really allowed to be truthful about what's going on in their mental health. They will, it literally will affect their, their, their job. Their license, exactly. Pilots, you know, same thing. We work. We've got a, a pilot that's come through uh, our program, and and same thing. They don't get to tell the truth about these experiences. So the burdens that they begin to carry, um, you know, and again, Tate and I, and you know, we're we're men that have lived the, the, those burdens as well. So you know, I'm I'm curious, like, what are some of the tools that you use, like some of the entry level in your meld work? Right. For, for men that have just been emotionally suppressed 
living these old stories, not feeling safe in their bodies, whether they know it or not, what are just some of the entry level tools that you could, even for our listeners, something they could take away with, uh, to, to actually go and work with. Yeah. Yeah. First we, um, sort of take it outside of the emotions. So we create a frame where, you know, I've said it in a lot of different ways, but essentially one, you're not bad. You're not broken. It's, you know, it's not you, it's the trauma and the culture you grew up in, but you really don't have an emotional problem. You have a physiological mistraining. And so let us help retrain your physiology. And right there, guys down regularly because it's gotten a little better, but still, I think most guys come to us and they're like this around, oh, my emotions. And like you're saying about the doctors and the pilots and, you know, I can't, you know, those, those professions, particularly, I can't talk about my emotional vulnerabilities. And so when we just take all that off the table, guys, relax. And then we talk a little about the science to, to you know, appease them and, and, and give them a model because our minds as guys, we have a bigger frame or a different frame to, to put our experiences in. It's a little better to work with. So we, we create that frame, the physiological frame, we talk about stress and survival, and we talk about the co-regulation. And then we, we start giving them somatic experiences. And it could be as simple as doing a somatic mindfulness meditation, which is very passive. It's, you know, very subjective and personal. And so if I'm leading it, I might take them through a five, maybe 10 minute somatic meditation where they're just feeling their bodies. That's all they're doing. And it's relaxing. And I've been doing it and teaching it for decades. Uh, and guys come out and they go, oh, that was easy. Oh, I feel more relaxed. So. And then we just say, that's what we're going to do. And then we might do some kind of real subtle breath work, teach them some breath stuff, to, how to relax. Uh, and then like if it's particularly a lie training, we'll teach these guys not only how to read their own body, but how to read, say, your body. And that's really powerful on several fronts because – if I'm going to really read you, I got to read myself. And by reading you, I learn more about myself and I'm naturally building co-regulation and my conscious mind is starting to think and track about these physical things, which is a new whole thing to track. So we're getting guys oriented around their physiology from many different perspectives. And then they're hearing other guys having similar experiences because when they have it alone, they think, Oh, maybe I'm weird or maybe I'm the only one. But when they hear other guys talk about how a simple meditation or a little exercise was this profound experience for them. Yeah. You know, it gives credibility to their own experience. Well, well, I like how you start with normalizing men's experiences because men, we really get beat up in the world these days, you know, and I think a lot of men are wrestling with this. There's a lot of cultural shaming of men, you know, this whole toxic masculinity languaging and, 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 um, and look, you know, we're not, we're not innocent. We, uh, we have done our, we have done harm, no doubt about it, but I staying there obviously doesn't help us move towards healing. And so I, I think that's, I, I really love just the initial normalizing of, of there's nothing wrong or broken with us. It's, it's, we've just been, would you say physiologically mistrained? So there's a question I, I really want to ask you, particularly you, <clears throat> Owen, about, because you've been working with men for 40 years. And <clears throat> like you, you, you pointed this out, I already mentioned it once, like it, all men resist doing something new, then they do it and get great value. And then they become you know champions of it. What are some other axioms that you've learned that are like universal <clears throat> in the world of men's work? Do, do you know what I mean by that question? Yeah, I, I think I do. I'll give you one example that, that flashed up. Um, uh, my partner is a couples therapist. We do couples workshops and couple retreats. We're going to be doing one in Costa Rica on Valentine's week. Um, and inevitably, you know, we do a little teaching and then when the couples go off 
as a couple and do a little exercise. And we walk around. This is the part I love. You know, my partner calls me the, the emotional hitman. So I get these guys <laughs> to cry. I get them to open okay. up. Uh, so uh-huh. if the two of you were a couple and Brian, you're, you know, you're, you're talking to your lovely wife here and, and she says, checking out or she's you know her nonverbals are telling both of us uh this is not working you're picking it up because you've seen it before and that's making you more stressed but you're trying harder you know where that's going and so i sit next to your brian i go can i help you here and you go yeah yeah help me please <laughs> uh, <laughs> and i you know i sort of frame what's happening and sort of like we were just saying and then i said i'm gonna speak what i believe you're feeling but not saying Oh, yeah, okay. And so I take a second, sort of drop down, sort of channel you. And I talk to your beautiful wife. And I start saying what I believe you're feeling. And inevitably, within about 15 seconds, your eyes start to tear up, your whole physiology changes, you loosen up, you open up. And you, Brian, are like your jaws dropping. You go, yeah, that's what I feel. And I, so I do that for a minute or so, so it gets anchored in. And then I say, look, she knows you feel this. Uh, she wouldn't be here, but she needs to feel it. And she, you know, like we were saying earlier, you need to speak it in a way that she feels it. Now, some a little technique, I don't usually use that word, but a little technique here is what I notice is what you're doing is what most of us do is you think you're using emotional words and you're not. And so you're using words that might be emotional, but really what you're doing is you're analyzing, you're suggesting, you're fixing, maybe judging, and probably a few other things thrown in there. Telling telling a story. Telling a story, you know, all this stuff, but you're not, using your emotional words in an emotional way. And so you're, she's getting disconnected. And so you need to find a way. And then I guide you in how to speak what I just spoke using your own words. And then that, you know, you go, I don't think I can do it. I go, yes, you can just try. And you know, you don't, you know, this is the first time you don't do it well, but here's the beauty of it. She feels you're trying. That's 90% of it. Your, your score might be a 10, but your efforts like a hundred percent. And she starts to open up because she knows it's hard for you, but you're trying. And then, you know, over the course of the in a weekend or whatever, I keep coming back and you, know, I keep helping you and I help her and I help her to understand how hard it is for you. So I hear a couple, a couple kind of axioms in there. One, one, you know, I've often since, since, since doing men's work myself, starting that journey about 10 years ago, I it, it quickly figured out, wow, if you, if you ask a man what he feels, he'll tell you what he thinks. And learning that language of feelings is a, is a, is a new language for us men. It really is not, not that all women do this great right a lot of women really suck at this too they're also great at storytelling but yes they can suck at it yes (laughs) they do it differently right so i hear like there's a new language that that to be a to be emotionally intelligent connected we do need to learn a new language and the other thing that i hear in that is in the domain of, of intimacy is and you know there's this other distinction and I've, again, Tate and I, we both have lived this a million times is like trying doesn't mean checking off a box, right? It doesn't mean, I mean, I, I tried to check off boxes with my now wife early in our relationship, you know, by just doing the thing she said she wanted, you know, calling her twice a day instead of just once <laughs> I check, check that box off, but she hated it because she could hear in my voice, I was just checking off a box. I wasn't actually trying to create connection. I was just, and, and that when men genuinely lean into, to the attempt to connect, even if they, they, they fail miserably at it, but the leaning in the sincere attempt is, uh, it carries, it, it, it matters. It has impact. 
on the relationship. And it's that, that alone is, is valuable. Like they just want us to show up in that sense. So I hear too, uh, Tate, what else is, what's coming up for you, man, as we round the end of our, towards the end of our conversation with Owen? Yeah. You know, Owen, one of the things that I'm, I'm just so, um, I guess impressed, uh, with you about is, is the 30 year journey that you've been on here. And I think there's, there's two ways that, that men can think about that, which is, oh my God, I've been, you know, this is going to be a 30 year journey and uh, th we're still going to be doing this thing called men's work. But the other is to, to really realize that this is, you know, the journey that you begin in the world of men's work then starts opening us up in ways that really do have us become champions for it. But it's not like we arrive. So, you know, one of the things I'm always curious to ask men is, you know, what is your, Owen, what is your new edge in this space? What is it that you're, you're leaning into still to this day that you're trying to tweak or trying to enhance or a part of either your somatic or emotional development that, that is alive and present for you now so that, so that men don't put other men on a pedestal, but they still find them as, as their partners on this journey, whether or not you've been in it 30 years or 30 minutes. Yeah. I, I see it as, you know, I, you know, this is maybe part of the Asperger's thing. I sort of geek out on things. So this is one of the things I geek out on. Um, and it's also like being an athlete, you get into a sport and like, I got into this sport later in life, but it's like, eh, you know, I'm just going to do this sport. And now I really enjoy the sport. I enjoy playing with my team and, 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 and it's a challenge, you know, and then, you know, having a business for this and making it a successful business and, and serving men, I mean, all of these variables that we're dealing with, it's a challenge and, and, you know, being able to do the best I can of walking my talk. Uh, and then, you know, having a relationship and, uh, you know, showing up in a vulnerable way, particularly when it's difficult. So yes, um, it's something that's never going to end. It's like, you know, we're never going to stop brushing our teeth. Uh, but you get to a point and I've seen and it if myself. you do, you're in trouble. trouble. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 And so, and it's like, I was just said to my, well, my client said to me, you, there's no turning back. You get to a point where you, you can't stop being aware once you're aware. So, right. and then it's like, well, if I'm going to be aware, how can I hone this awareness or leverage my awareness to keep improving? Not that I have to, like I have problems in my life, but I get a, re a good ROI. I get a return on, on this effort that, feeds me and feeds the people I care about. So, you know, as we've all said, and we've all probably got into this because we had a problem, but at some point we, you know, we're staying in because we're getting a return on it. And my view of mastery is it's not a static state. It's not, I never expect to be a master at this, but, you know, I'm on the path of mastery and, you know, I do see improvements and they get subtler, but, relatively speaking, they certainly can still be significant. Yeah, I think that's pretty profound. You know, 30 years in this work, and and one of the things you alluded to earlier is that you do think that men are getting better at, at jumping into this kind of work before the crisis, or at least maybe at the first crisis and they don't need the fourth crisis, whatever level that might be. What, what do you see as, as the future, you know, growth of, of this work, the, 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 whether or not it's somatic work or the emotional intelligence work, the, how, what does the evolution look like? Where is men's work another decade or even two decades from now? Um, well, I'm starting to write another book, and it's going to be, uh, you know, essentially what we're doing with Meld, which is a lot of the somatics. But also, I realized, and I think you guys realize this too, but it just dawned on me, you know, maybe in the last year, was I, you know, I, again, I'm an old guy, like you said, I'm 71, so I've been around a while. So I was sort of here in the beginning of the the personal development movement. And, you know, I got into that and, you know, as a client, you know, as a practitioner, as a student, as a teacher in all different ways, and I'm still for it. But what I realized, and I think it's right in front of us and we didn't, you know, I didn't realize it, 
for years was there's another movement ha happening that we're 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 in the forefront of which is this communal growth and so we've been very individualistic in this culture and now we, we're talking about it but our personal development's been that way too and I, I I think what we all are doing here with our groups and our trainings is that we're we're taking that or the best of that and putting it into our community or communal or attachment realm of connection and and the power of communal healing and growth and and, and the necessity of it. And my hope and my feeling is is that's the next you know, generation of this work is really the embodiment and the acceptance of the communal factor. You are speaking, you are speaking to my spirit right now. That is such a, a major focus of my interest right now, community, both in my, especially in my personal life with my wife and our live, where we live and com community. That is such a hunger that we're so alive to, and it's painful because this is not a culture that, that I, in my experience, at least in my experience, doesn't do community well. We have no idea what we're doing. So, uh, oh man, we could do a whole other podcast on that. Uh, that's a really profound answer. Let's finish up with this question because we, we get this a lot. I'd really love to hear what, um, what wisdom you have for this. So what, what advice? So the, the a lot of women will listen to this podcast. A lot of women are partnered with men that are, sh that may be emotionally disconnected, right? Imagine that, right? What, what do you say when a woman comes to you and says, uh, I literally have an, uh, me, Brian, I literally have an email right now that a woman wrote to me the other day. Who's, who's, he's, she's listening to my, my audio book, uh, choose her every day or leave her. And she's like, keeps telling her husband, she wants him to listen to it and he's resisting, et cetera. I haven't answered yet. So maybe I'll just copy and paste what you tell me right now. I'm really curious. Oh, and what do you say to women? How can they support the men in their lives to pursue emotional growth in a way that's, that's effective and doesn't just cause that man to, to shut down or resist even further? That's a good question. And we get, as you probably do, a lot of referrals from women and now from therapists, which are usually women. Um, uh, my core answer is take the risk in a vulnerable way and tell that man the impact that he's having and not having and not in a way you're making him wrong, but in a compassionate way. So he hears it. And so, you know, if I'm your partner, Brian, and you're, you're that, that guy, you know, I might say, look, Brian, I love you. And you know, I love you. And, you know, I believe you're in pain. I see that pain. And yeah, let's just be honest. Our relationship's not what we want. And I know you're trying. I know you're really trying. I know you love me. And and I, and I know that and I appreciate that. But you just don't have the skills. And it's not your fault. You know, you, you know I know your father. I know where you came from. Yeah, you didn't have any training. You didn't have any models. And, and I, you know, I know this culture. It doesn't really give us much. Uh, and I don't think you really need therapy. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, you and I and whatever. I mean, we could do couples therapy, but it's like there's nothing really wrong with you, but you just don't have these skills. And I see how it pains you. And it pains me because I care about you and I care about our relationship. And, you know, I just want to support you. And I sort of believe or I wonder if you need to just do something just with men and not, you know, not with me or maybe even couples therapy, which, again, you know, I'm a supporter of. But, you know, that you just find some support on your own because, you know, I have my friends. And you see what it does for me, but you really don't have close friends. and it, and, it, and it, that hurts me. I'm concerned about you. So those kinds of conversations where where the the woman is is you know really speaking in a way where the guy feels like she's on his side and has his back and not making him wrong because we as we know guys are real sensitive. We don't take something on unless we think we can win it. So we don't get into relationships and marriage expecting to lose. And so 
when it starts to look like we're losing, we go into a panic. And we might try harder, but we're trying harder doing all the wrong things. And so when the partner can explain in a way that's compassionate and vulnerable and just lays it out on a personal level that's supportive, that's probably the most effective incentive for that guy to try something that you normally wouldn't try. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I hear giving feedback, not criticism. Right, giving giving him feedback about the impact, not criticizing him, not blaming, shaming, and also also what I really liked about that is is offering suggestions, but not conclusive directions. Like you should do this, like therapy is the way for you, or go work. Like not telling him what to do. That's which you know most men doesn't t tend to go over well with us, but offering suggestions, but in the end, putting it in his court, man, f figure it out. I trust that you can figure this out for yourself. In the woman's defense, I will say in this culture, you know, as men, we default in relationships where the woman's the emotional responsible party. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. for so yeah. many guys, the relationship or marriage evolves where the woman's the, the emotions for everyone, for totally. her, for the relationship and for him. And by default, sort of the quasi therapist or expert around emotion. So, so realize that that guy, and this is not him intentionally, but he sort of defaulted to empowering you as the woman to be the emotional expert. And, and, and this is what my part of my TEDx talk was about years ago was that we grew up, we grow up in this culture where, you know, ever since an industrial revolution, guys have been gone. So women had to step up and raise us. And the teachers were women. So our model of emotionality for men has become some of a feminine model, which is not a bad thing, but it's not our model. So the tendency women have, and it's a natural tendency, is that they're going to project or suggest out of their model and their what works for women. And it might, you know, and if, you know, I'm your wife, it might work. You know, if I'm talking to you as my female friend, but not as my husband. And and so what might support a woman could turn a guy off. Hmm. Yeah. You know, before we ask this last question, Tate, to, to wrap up, because there's something that I want to make sure we don't leave this conversation before I ask you. You you because you just said it again in, in a way. It, you use the term when you say emotional intelligence. I, I notice you often put the word masculine emotional intelligence, right? You just pointed out that a lot of the emotional work and relationship, or or the expectation, is is kind of comes from a female frame of of, of emotionality. But, but what do you? So what's the distinction? What do you? Why masculine emotional intelligence versus just emotional intelligence? What what is that qualifier? Uh, yeah, we have a different physiology, obviously, a different body and somewhat a different physiology, a different culture. And yeah, this whole gender thing, it's just gotten, I think, confusing and, you know, and political mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, men are different and women are different. And, and we want difference. That creates a polarity. Polarity is good. It creates attractions and sometimes a, if, a if fighting, I didn't want but... a woman, honestly, if I didn't want a woman, I would have married Tate. Long time ago, <laughs> but I kept cute. him. I kept him as my best friend because I wanted something really way more different than he is. So I, hundred <laughs> percent. And so, yeah, I think we're just starting to unpack that. Like uh, Richard Reeves' book of Boys and Men does a good job of starting to unpack it from a very intellectual level, which I'll I support. So. You know, I think that's another way to look at it and just take it out of the politics and, and that, you know, guys and boys, we've been swimming in, in a world that's been more feminized. And I don't say that in a conspiracy theory way or in, you know, with any charge. It's just natural. And one of the things I do like about what well, I like everything about what Richard Beef says, but the thing that I really took away was his his analysis of politics was that the conservatives want to take man back into the 50s you know like the guy's right and that's where it begins and ends and the liberals think that anything you do for a boy or a man takes it away from a woman and it doesn't and what women are starting to realize and this goes to your question is selfishly which i'm all for women are saying you know 
if you know if I'm going to have a good re- relationship with you, Brian, you got to be successful, and I probably need to support that. And I'm in a short term, you know, it might be a little rough, and I might not get what I want, and and I'm going to you know have to learn some things too. And and I think women are picking that up. That you know, one of my old metaphors is I might love you, and I'm you know I and I find this beautiful material because that's who, who I am, and I make you this dress, and you feel the the love in that dress. But what are you going to say? You're a guy. You're going to say thanks, honey, but I don't wear dresses. And and that's sort of often how guys feel around the suggestions that they get from their partners. They mean well, but it doesn't fit them. So powerful. Oh, and I, I just, I'm really uh, grateful for who you are as a man in the world and the impact that you're making and, 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 and the way that you're bringing your gifts to the, the listeners of, of men this way. And, and just as, as a way of concluding, where can our listeners learn more about you? Um, then, you know, the best way is our website, meld, M-E-L-D, dot community, and this community spelled out. Um, you know, I'm there. They can find me there. They can find what we offer. We have we have a free membership. We, you know, we have weekly newsletters. I give out, I write a weekly, and I have done for going over three years, a weekly group guide for groups that they can use that will take a topic and sort of I'll dissect it and then give them props that they can use or adjust for their groups. Because uh, again, you know, like all of us, I really support guys in groups. I want guys in groups. It's, it could be the best investment that you ever make in your life. Thank you. Yeah, that's a fact. Thank and that'll you. be in the show notes, meld.community. That'll be uh, in the show notes. You can just click on the link there. It'll take you right there. Uh, Owen, man, it's such a such a, an honor, truly, to have a, a, a true elder in this space, uh, to be in conversation with you. Thank you for uh, coming on to Men This Way. We really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you guys for inviting me and for the work you're doing and supporting men and and, you know, I know the work it takes to do that, mm-hmm. but I also know the rewards that you get. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. That is a fact on both, both accounts. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, Owen. Thank you.